Uh, thank you all for being here. It's an amazing showing. We are very grateful. I'm Ryan Obrecht, professor in the history department and director of the classical studies minor. Uh, it's such a joy to introduce to you today the speaker for our event, Sarah Burnett. Um, come on in. Um, who um, has been a friend of mine for many years. So Sarah is a poet. We met at Boston College as undergrads 20 something years ago. Don't need to worry about the details of that. Um, she's done a lot of things since then. She has an MA in English from UVM, an MA in creative writing from the University of Maryland. She's worked in publishing. She's been a teacher. She's become mother to two wonderful kids. And she has always, in all that time, remained a writer. I think since the earliest time I met you. Sarah has received funding to participate in Vermont's prestigious Bread Loaf Writers Conference on several occasions. Her work has appeared in over a dozen publications and literary reviews. And her book, Seed Celestial, um, is her first book. It also won the Autumn House Poetry Prize last year for 2022. Um, I invited Sarah here to talk about her work with us, talk about some of her poems and about what inspires her and to talk a little bit about the path she's walked since graduating college, since um, many of you are kind of hopefully thinking about those steps as well. So I'm gonna see the floor, let you talk for a little bit, and uh, please first help me um, welcome her to USD. So, Sarah. Um, it's really great to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, and I'm really sorry about the seating. What a great problem to have. Um, uh, Hopefully there's room in the, there's a chair over there for sure. Um, anyways, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Sarah Burnett. Um, and I'm really excited to um, read some poems with you today. And also I really want this to be kind of informal in the sense of that if you have questions, you know, feel free to ask at any time, raise your hand. Um, and then Ryan and I, we know poetry readings, you know, we'll break it up. We're not just gonna, I'm not just gonna sit here and, and read poems at you for an hour. Um, but I do wanna tell you about my book. Um, and in my book, basically, we're gonna divide this up into about three themes that I continually go back to, one of which is climate change. And I speak a lot about climate change through the power of, of myth. Um, and the other one I speak a lot about is about ethnic identity, specifically my um, sort of biracial upbringing. Um, I'm the daughter of a Cuban immigrant. And also about the identity of motherhood and what that means, especially um, when you also relate that to climate change. Um, a little bit about, I know um, many of you here um, are coming um, with an interest in the classics. Um, and I certainly have had an interest in the classics for almost as long as, I mean, since I was very, very young. Um, and I did take a lot of classes with Ryan in BC. He wasn't a classics minor, just a little shy of it, but um, but I loved it and the myths have stayed with me. And um, I think that you will see a lot of them in, in the book. It is my hope also, of course, that people who aren't familiar with classic myths of Demeter and Persephone, um, for example, can pick this up and read it um, and feel like they're included in the conversation. But I do I think that, you know, the importance of a myth and adds a depth um, to to our, our own historical moment right now. I mean, this book is definitely a book about our own historical moment. There are themes of climate change, as I mentioned. There's also gun violence and here and other issues of ethnic and racial identity, all the things that are very much, you know, of our moment. But um, this is not the first time our, you know, humanity has been here. And, um, and I think the classics can teach us that and show us that. Um, Lucretius, um, is, um, you know, help me organize this book. I mean, I'm a writer um, and you can imagine me with a lot of poems um, sitting there and trying to figure out, well, how do they go all together in a book, which is a whole other process of writing for those of you who may be writers. Do I have any writers in the room? Anyone who's a, it, first of all, you don't need to publish anything to be a writer. You just need to write. So I actually, it's probably everyone in this room. Um, but but in order to put, you know, to put the the beast together, how do you organize it? And I kept, you know, I couldn't. I I just kept on, you know, had I was about seven months pregnant with my second child, so I had a deadline. 
clearly. Um, and i am got my papers all, spru all sprawled out and I'm trying to figure it out. And I, and this is where some the magic of creativity can happen. Something told me to, you know, go back into Lucretius. I had taken a course in my MFA program with, we talked a lot about Lucretius. Um, and so I was like, okay. So I went back and I don't have my copy here, but it's very well loved. And I read through it and some of the you know, being immersed in some of the words in my poems began to pop out. And they are the section headers, um, seed, animal, word, earth, celestial. And from there, I was able to really, you know, organize the poems in a way that, you know, made sense. And I think, hopefully, Lucretius would approve of the sort of eternal newness of those ideas that are in there. I think that's part of his point, too, and the many generative seeds that are in there. So I've spoken a lot. Um, I said I wouldn't do. Um, I'm going to read some poems now. Um, the first poem uh, that I'm going to read is called Enling. Um, you know, this came from just reading an article in the Atlantic by a writer named Ed Young. And I mentioned him because he's got a great book out called An Immense World, which I highly recommend. Um, anyways, it's called Enling. There's a man who cares for the last snail of its kind, Echignella apixvulva, knows precisely how much moisture, shade, and light it needs to thrive while it spends its dwindling time in a glass cabinet. Don't think about what you can start, think about what you can end, was the advice I heard on a time management podcast while slicing bananas for my daughter's breakfast. The banana comes from Guatemala, where its kind is plagued by the fusarium fungus to a possible, almost certain, if it continues at this rate, extinction. I've never been to Guatemala, seen a rotting banana plant, or touched a snail's glossy shell of the kind that resembles the palate of a chocolate box. Dark brown, chestnut, white, the occasional splash of mint. I watch my daughter collect stones in her plastic bucket, clinking them beside her as she runs smiling from one corner of our yard to another, impossible to say if this July is the warmest month since the last warmest month until it is. My dread a garden crawling with invasive insects. Later, she smashes bananas at the table between her dirt-crusted fingernails, laughs at the stickiness while I try to finish the article I started days ago about Achignella apixvulva, whose largest threat is, you might have guessed, another snail. Eulandina rosea, aptly named for its rosy-hued carapace who will follow the slimy trail of its gastropod cousin, then yank it from its shell with its serrated tongue and swallow it like Cronus, shell and all. When a species is a last of its kind, it's called an enling, a word that reminds me of changeling, such a fairy swap child I've called my own. I have made this place for her, warm, soft, a place that someday I'll not be allowed to enter, that may not even survive me. This um, next poem I'm going to read um, is uh, the first in a series of poems that I write from the perspective of Demeter. And I'm sure many of you know the myth of Demeter and Persephone and how that was certainly a story that um, the ancients gave for the reasons why we have seasons. But it really also is a great metaphor for climate change and I couldn't resist. Um, and also writing from Demeter's perspective, we often hear from Persephone, I think, more than Demeter. Demeter's wager. At first, it didn't seem horrific. The earth dying as I felt, if I could, like dying. I stopped eating, dressing, coloring my hair. Then I grew sick of the trees. The way they, full and green, mocked how I felt, so I stripped them bare. After that, it was easier to let go. Slowly, I gave away my belongings and hers, shoes, belts, coats, still wearing her scent, books with their dog-eared pages, 
Then meadows, estuaries, streams, forests and their forest creatures, whole species of birds and fish. It was almost eerie how light I felt when I didn't care for earth. Every day, no surprise, the sky, the color of lint. When I thought, finally, there's nothing left to save or throw away, I remembered I had all eternity, an empty glass to fill. I couldn't shrink it, so I expanded it, the way a bruise on a fruit rots it entirely. At some point, we're all deceived. Some days I hear her voice in the kitchen, other days only my echo. Call it grief or despair, it doesn't matter. Every day I kneel down and feed it. Bless this rash of fires, this flooded city, this cracked, parched earth. So all the water, all the salt, all the spoils of this world hear me say, I am your daughter too. So along that series of poems, um, the next poem is called The Meter's Remorse. These are what are called persona poems. So when you write a poem like this, you're obviously writing in the voice of a character, which is um, which I found very generative and also just a lot of fun. Um, Demeter's Remorse. All the days she was mine alone. That second before a cut bleeds clean through a white bandage red. That summer we canned pears. I still haven't opened them. So now I'm going to read um, a poem where I'm also really talking about um, my identity sort of becoming a mother. Um, the title of it is called Ab Ovo from the Latin meaning from the beginning or from the egg, from the egg. So not from nothing, my yolk and hatchling, pomegranate jewel set and membrane, clot and thread, honey of the hive. I didn't know you one of seven million chances hibernating in a fluid sac, waiting for the signal to implant yourself. Out of the vestibular bulb, the tulip, the peacock feather, the fern. In another life, you were a crocus pushing up through snow. I was a doe crossing a busy stretch of road alone. Unfurl your leaves, your top-heavy camellia head. You made a bed from pressed petals in the swaddling dark. Your body was that supple. I kept a wad of soaked cabbage leaves to cool the sores. Forgive the ways I'm ill-prepared to receive you, for you to break from this body into your own. In another life, I was the wind prickling your ear to keep you still. You were a deer in tall grass. Jump ahead to another poem uh, titled Last Chance to See. Or in the other, some of the poems I'm I'm really you know, taking it from the voice of, of Persephone and looking at the problem of climate change. But of course, it's a it's a very real threat that I think about all the time. I have two young kids; they're six and three, um, and I mean, it's probably on all of our minds. I'm no doubt. Last chance to see. It's not easy to watch my decisions grow unfettered. Once she was a wet animal gently scratching the insides of my abdomen, letting me know my body wasn't mine alone. I was permitted to use it for a time, mostly assured that the animals I bedded down with on this earth would be there in the morning, roaming in their packs and herds, digging up the bones of other creatures as one day my own, though I hardly ever acknowledge this matter except in the nest of a poem. With my daughter toddling yesterday, we plunged our rain boots into piles of wet, slick, colorful leaves. I didn't use to mind a warm fall day. I enjoyed a hard rain from a distance. I didn't use to question water, bees, ice caps, migratory patterns of birds in late winters, miss the shade of a tree when passing by its stump. 
And how can I not question the collective potential of our species after birthing bombs, automatic weapons, plastics, and styrofoam, but also the smallpox vaccine, light bulbs, the regenerative patchwork of the ozone layer? I didn't used to be an insomniac. I didn't used to hear my body say, feel this, this loss. I just pulled along a toy on a string. Loss, which comes from the Middle English los, ruin, destruction, and which now carries the additional meaning of failure to keep what was once in one's possession. Someday, someone, maybe me, will tell her about the coral reefs, perennially snow-capped Everest, and abundance of strawberries year-round. But now I lick my molting fur, gnaw anxiously on bones, and scrape the crystallized bits of honeycomb with my teeth. How can I not eye the shallow stream with its tiny silver fish floating belly up without suspicion? She points and I say, they're sleeping. Let's not throw rocks today. To her, I can repair anything. That stuck zipper she can't pull, sealed cup she can't open, wonky eyeball hanging from her bear's plush face. Mender, healer, fixer, more God than human than animal is a mother. But my body too has grown soft, stretched and looser in places where it was once hard and muscular. The minerals and immunity she extracted from me, joints she slackened, throbbing veins she surfaced to skin, scar left above my pubic bone. Somewhere in those depths, I know what it means to be animal, to growl, to buck, to claw against dangers, to love more savagely when threatened to lose. Well, we'll just do one more, one more in this section, I think. Um, another one of the Demeter poems. Um, this is a poem in three sections. Oh, I meant to say, as I was reading that poem, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm from Maryland. I mean, living in Maryland right now. I'm from New Jersey, but. Um, yeah, so like the wet fall, the leaves, like rain boots. And I was like, oh, palm trees, this is not, this is yeah. a different fall here. <laughs> You've got to imagine, you know, mid-Atlantic. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, okay. Demeter remembering. Um, oh, this is told in sort of three sections. So I'll just kind of pause in the middle of each section a little bit more. I planted seeds where no one thought anything could grow an insurance policy for raising her among humankind. There in damp caverns or wedged in sand or under sheets of ice, I buried crocs full of pestilence and greed, knowing the likelihood of them being unearthed. And what did it feel like? To kill my darlings? To kill? It led me straight to hell where I knew they'd be waiting. Of course, they blamed a childless woman for opening the jars, the altar of motherhood too sanctified. I cut first, or maybe it was my own daughter running away. Either way, you know what they say about us. Women or gods, we're a jealous lot. But mothers, there's no ends to the earth we wouldn't scorch or drown with love. I had my doubts. We mothers do. Even if she returned to me, I knew some part of me would not. I took the emptiness of my hands and scattered it everywhere. Is there another way to be true to yourself? Forgiveness has never been something I wanted, as if I had a choice. So I think I'll pause there. <laughs> some of those about, the, about language and identity, um, since that's the direction we're heading at. <laughs> Um, the poem I'm going to read first is called um, Ethnic Arithmetic. Um, and to your point, the question, this is a contrapuntal poem. So it's a form, it's got a certain form. Um, you can imagine, um, for those you can see, like sort of two columns on the page. You read the left side first, then the right, and then both together. So like in a musical composition, you could hear like, the first song, then the second song, and then the both come together to combine like a different, another melody. Um, and in case you're curious, you know, do you, do you write in form? Do you not? I mean, um, 
I had had the draft of the poem, just a single kind of free verse poem. And I had a professor at Bread Loaf who was like, have you heard about the contrapuntal poem? I think this poem could work really well with it. You're talking about biraciality, which is true. So it's sort of a, a content meets form. And the poet who I um, would like to uh, acknowledge um, would be um, a great African American poet, Tahiba Jess, who has this terrific book, Olio, um, where he uses this form a lot. And um, so I just, you know, read it and read it and read it and read it and, you know, um, took my old poem and put them together. But it talks about, um, as it relates to you guys, actually the experience of filling in the, um, the you know, check what identity you are boxes um when you and I just remember having such a visceral reaction to that on my college application um a lot of my poems can come from anger too it's really great um ethnic arithmetic Again, I check ethnicity boxes as if I could measure with a stick figure to derive the crude dimensions I'd wanted to keep separate as black beans and rice might never together. My mother sign it's how a true Cuban eats them. Her quick smile betraying some part of me quiet, another confused as though like her with a doll and suitcase forever in hand. She rubs the white of her forearm with two fingers, a gesture I've learned conveys superiority that says, look at me, I belong here, not there. Check guilt, shame, denial, check every cliche. Write fractions half and half next to squares, a type of equation, devise an algorithm of my identity. Those parts, moros y cristianos, nunca con gris, never together, but you don't have any accent. Who am I to know who I am, sliding back and forth invisibly, and because of this, and maybe only this, which feature to cover or show, as if a distinctive mark, a curl of tongue, a darker jaundiced eye, check what's fair, what's not I know exists to erase me. Again, I check ethnicity boxes, write fractions half and half next to squares, as if I could measure with a stick figure a type of equation, devise an algorithm to derive the crude dimensions I'd wanted of my identity, those parts to keep separate as black beans and rice, moros y cristianos nunca con gris, never together, my mother sighing, it's how a true Cuban eats them, but you don't have any accent, her quick smile betraying, who am I to know who I am? Some part of me quiet, another confused as though sliding back and forth invisibly like her with a doll and suitcase forever in hand. And because of this, and maybe only this, she rubs the white of her forearm with two fingers, which feature to cover or show a gesture I've learned conveys superiority as if a distinctive mark that says, look at me, I belong, a curl of tongue, a darker jaundiced eye, here, not there, check guilt, shame, denial, check what's fair, what's not, check every cliche I know exists to erase me. Um, so the next one I'm going to read, uh, as Ryan mentioned, I was a high school English teacher for, um, gosh, like just like six and a half years, seven years. Um, and the last school I was in was in DC. Um, it was a um, tenth grade English was called English Two. Um, very creative name. Um, and uh, anyways, a lot of uh, um, anyways. This, this is another poem in which I grapple with my ethnic identity as it comes um, with some of my immigrant students. But Miss, I make good money. He tells me after we've tallied the days missed. Enough for his black jeans, black hoodie, sneakers, and the rest to send back to El Salvador. You should see me miss at work sometime. I don't say I was there last week at the Asian fusion restaurant where water pipes down a green glass wall and you can order dim sum at any time of night. I don't say I didn't see him while he worked in the back scrubbing dishes, mopping floors, hefting economy-sized containers of rice and oils, spices and cans of sauces, sorting silverware in bins, taking out the trash. 
when hours later he should be in my class, where we're reading things fall apart, and when he's there, I'm often at his side to catch him up, to help him get at least enough to pass. My grade, I want to know my grade, miss, and I have to tell him he's failing. As his older brother chides him in English and in Spanish, he doesn't know I understand both because I didn't say I understand, nor did I offer to speak in my broken Spanish. If I'm the white maestra to them, keeper of test scores, the red pen, of a kind of knowledge you can buy your way into, if you're lucky, if you pass, I wouldn't deny that truth. I imagine how it might have been for my mother when she arrived in Miami in 1960 from Havana, the only Hispanic in her class, when Abuelo forbade singing or laughter, noting how many were dying or dead or in prison back home. It's not the same story. It is the same story. I go back and forth in time. I hear Abuelo say, lo más importante son los papeles, and my mother say, speak English outside. But my student, not yet a man, sits in front of me in a country not yet his home, a country who doesn't see him, or even me sometimes, and I wonder, what can he learn that he doesn't know from me? Who am I to say this book is worth the clothes on his back, the money home? How can I tell him what a day is worth? The next morning, his empty chair, and later, Miss, I'm sorry about class. Um, the next poem I'm going to read um, talks about my grandfather, my mother's side from Cuba. Um, Cuba, for me, is also a land of myth. Um, I grew up hearing the stories of when they were going to go back to Cuba, um, and this was going to happen. And it was this mythical land that I could never go to. And for a long time, you know, American citizens could not go there. Um, and I still haven't been there um, to this day. So, it, and even if I could, you know, it wouldn't be the same. Abuelo mio. Abuelo, there are moments when you're in my head, in evening sometimes my whole head yours. I wonder how far you travel on these nights between us, stacked like rows of sugarcane stalks, wild, uneven, quietly ripening in their sheaths in fields far from your city, old Havana, your dream city and mine. And a ciudad I've never been to but have scanned with my black pelican eye. I trace the narrow arm of Calle Obispo, a vein packed with peddlers hawking wares and vendors selling papayas next to a polished slew of Pontiacs, Buicks, and Fords, still there, still parked on the side. I've walked the long esplanade of the Malacón, its generous wide berth of roadway and seawall, and looked out onto the horizon for you there but heard instead whispering lenguas of wind sluicing the sound of what you tell me in green lapping waves. What you must have heard on your way home, the same birds, pelicans, pigeons, gulls. What you must have seen on facades of buildings, escuelas, iglesias, cemeterios. What you must have felt while standing in the same rain, in the same streets of your plaza, bloodied and sweet, lighting your gray gaze. How it made you flee this city, this dream city, and love it from a distance. Abuelo, I hear you, and everywhere I try to read you in faces of birds and your favorite gardenia blooms, your knuckle wrinkles and high ridge thumbnails, a half moon shape vaulting at their base, to touch your hand with my own hand, the same moons, ridges, and veins. You're over a hundred now. You must be so tired. Help me understand what I see when I see you now. Let me not mistake you for shadow or crow. Don't let me pass you on the street and not know that I belong to you. Wear your face and your body for me. Sing to me slow. And the next poem I'm going to read is titled El Regreso, which means the return. And this really is... Um, it's written in a form called the pantoum form. Um, so we hear a lot of repeated lines. Um, and it really, I think, it speaks to the sort of repetitive nature of sitting there while, uh, you know, can imagine a, a little girl sitting and playing dominoes with a bunch of old guys and a few women peppered in. 
Under the orange glow of the flamboyant tree, they talk of El Regreso while sipping espresso from paper dummy tosses and at a round table after dinner after dominoes they will talk of el regreso of old cuba of old havana of all things old at a round table after dinner after dominoes do you remember the lechon do you remember tres leches cake hombre we never feasted better nodding the men agree puff on cigars do you remember how they sent our brothers to be slaughtered on playa giron they straighten the pleats of their guayaberas, leaning into their chairs. No one starts to leave. Shall we have another round? They straighten the pleats of their guayaberas, leaning into their chairs. Plumes of smoke rise from their cigars, resting in ashes. And the china I hid in the ceiling before we left. Do you remember? Nina, it is there. It is, it is yours, all of it. Plumes of smoke rise from cigars, resting in ashes, under the orange glow of the flamboyant tree. I just remembered the other, you know, I'd hear these stories. So one of those stories was like, you know, before we left, we would hid the china and the silverware in this fake ceiling in this closet. If you go in there and then, you know, it was all up there, you know, um, and then, you know, there we heard that the Russians have now occupied the house now. And it was all these mythical stories. I mean, half, you know, what part was real? What part was, you know, kind of made up there, abuelita, um, <laughs> you know? So I was like, uh, so, you know, I grew up with that as uh, that sort of these wonderful stories, great, great stories and myths. Um, the other, I think I'm going to read this poem about Hemingway because I think that fits with it. Um, called Hemingway's Homes. Um, some of you may know, um, obviously Hemingway had a big, big life in Cuba too. Um, Hemingway's Homes. And this is one of the stories, sometimes poems just like happen. They just, they happen exactly the way. And you just gotta get, have a pen ready and just write what happened. Literally, this was a poem that happened just like that. Hemingway's Homes. Hemingway lived nine years in the house in Key West, now overrun with tourists and polydactyl cats. The last time I was there, I was with Abuela and my mother, the only memory I have of the three of us. We drove from Miami. Abuela was in her late 80s, and Abuelo had died years before from a final stroke. She was alone much of the time and quieter, patiently waiting or distracted. I couldn't tell which. I remember her sitting on the passenger side, staring out the window, holding the cardboard flap from a gift box above her head to block the darting sun. Hemingway lived with his second wife, Pauline, in that house, though he spent much of the time away covering the Spanish Civil War, which left Pauline alone to oversee the remodeling of the abandoned stately colonial. He is said to have told her when she built the flagstone patio and dug 10 feet deep into the solid coral for the pool, Pauline, you've spent all but my last penny, so you might as well have that. And no one knows for sure if he really said that. So much surrounding Papa is legend, but there's a penny embedded in cement at the northernmost end of the pool, a sort of proof I saw for the story. It was for my sake we went to Papa's house. I was 19 or 20, had only read a movable feast then, and was completely taken with the idea that you could live with all your closest writer friends in Paris. Magical that you could hobnob with Pound, Fitzgerald, and Stein at cocktail parties. For her part, Abuela hardly paid attention during the tour. She lagged behind the group, fingering the upholstered chairs, which you could still touch then, and Pauline's 17th century Spanish Circassian walnut chest, and lifting glances upward at the many crystal chandeliers, enormous and catching the light. They could have been the same chandeliers I'll never see, but she had in her home outside Havana, where Hemingway also had a home, Finca Vigia, which he moved to in 1940 with his fourth wife, Mary using the place in Key West like a hotel on trips back and forth to catch him until he died there in 1961, a year after my family left Cuba, a year after it was clear the revolution meant to evict the wealthy, the middle classes, suspend elections, the Finca now a government museum. Perhaps Papa would have chosen to stay in Cuba, like my family, if he hadn't left to get treatment for depression. Perhaps later he wouldn't have shot himself. Either way, none of them would return. 
My mother was nine years old then, an equal span of time lapsed in the childhood, a marriage, the same that Hemingway lived in this house with Pauline, who stayed on, raised their two boys. I was in the gift shop combing the bookshelves, delving into a farewell to arms, oblivious to where my mother and abuela were. The novel Papa finished writing there I'd learned from the tour, and I could say more about that, but then I'd just be repeating the pattern of moving unexpectedly away. When my mother approached and said, Abuela met him, that he came to a cocktail party hosted at their house I'll never visit with a pool and a palm-lined terrace, I searched Abuela's face fixed on his photograph and said nothing. She told me she remembered his face, his mustache, remembered he drank, remembered that Abuela said he was a great American writer. But that was all she recalled and all I remembered. Afterward, we drove a half mile to the southernmost tip of the continental U.S. with its pot-bellied monument, a hulking concrete upside-down thimble, in actuality an old sewer junction that was too heavy to move, so they painted like a buoy, flocked to by visitors and gauls alike. Cuba lies 90 miles away, give or take, a floating mirage in a humid haze, cresting and collapsing with the waves. I remember Abuela's eyes anchored on the horizon as she inched closer to the precipice, as she said, this is the closest we'll get to home, to no one in particular, as if the wind and the water had a face, had a name, before they took her voice away. Sur C'est La Femme um, is from the French meaning, find the woman. Um, I wrote this poem, um, remember uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford when she was giving testimony um, about uh, whether they were, were going to confirm um, Justice Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. And I was livid. I could not believe that we were doing this again. Um, you know, obviously thinking about Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. And um, and I've got a two-year-old daughter and I'm just, I'm livid. And I was actually texting with Ryan at the time. I'm in Maryland, he's in California. And we were talking about, it. I don't remember the exact text about it, but he was like, sure, say la femme. And I'm like, what is that? I don't know what that is. And so he he taught me um, that that's from French mind the woman. And then I, of course I Wikipedia it and then down the rabbit hole we went and out came this very angsty, angry poem, um, which I encourage you to do with your anger ring, put that righteous anger to use. The other thing I do want to say about this poem is also to give an acknowledgement to um, a poet, um, Terrence Hayes. Um, I was, at the time, I was also reading um, his book, um, Poems for My, you know, Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. And he has a series of poems in there that, that starts with there never was a black male hysteria. So I kind of, you know, look, took that idea and went with it um, from, you know, just livid from that trial or sorry, confirmation hearing. Um, Je sais la femme from French meaning find the woman. There never was the hysterical woman locked in an attic an animal on all fours tearing out her hair or threading a loom and unthreading it every night so she'd never have to bed her believed to be dead husband's friends. There never was the angry woman wailing over a kitchen sink, rubbing her hands raw, trying to cleanse herself of death, or a group of women banded together denying men sex as if they weren't already assumed plundered. There never was a black or red dress, a smoking gun, la femme fatale, chasse la femme. There never was a willing muse, never a bruise, a blemish, a scar. There never was the woman sacrifice on an altar with goats to sanctify a city who thought she had it coming and they, they would be saved. There never was the woman who drowned herself inexplicably in a lake as if there was no cause for her nightmares. Never the scarlet A, the prison break, the abortion clinic bust, a mob wielding pitchforks, the mist rent, stolen paycheck, burning pyres, the chant of lock her up. There never was that tower with the key, long strands of braided hair she could cut herself free from. There was the walk home, and every day the gauntlet of howlers, hollers, hoopla, the construction worker whistles, the can I get some fries with that shake, daddy's girl, teacher's pet, stank liquor breath, unmerciful panic, unheard prayer, the silence after a thousand doors slammed shut, slut. There was a blunt instrument, her body, 
There was an accident. Her mouth. There never was the hysterical woman. There was the man and his myth, and they would not die, no matter how many times we cried father, no matter how many times they were swallowed in dirt, the earth just spit them back out. Still working on the anger stuff. <laughs>